So I have a few questions to answer uh, from John in Boston. Hi, Celeste. Angular momentum should also correlate as a third factor on the same graph. Not the same graph, there are different variables. The graph has age and mass. The uh, <clears throat> Walensky-Taylor diagram has mass loss on the x-axis. Mass is lost. And age is down here. Of course, you have phases of matter to give things a little bit more depth. Um, if you include... Angular momentum on that graph, it's going to throw everything off. That's a completely different variable. There are lots of different variables. It says stellar mass should also correlate as a fourth factor. Stellar mass is on the graph, on this graph. If you're talking about the new gyro chronology graph, that's different. That has to deal with um, the total axial angular momentum which means it not only has to do with mass, it has to do with moment of inertia, it has to do with rotational velocity, and it also has to do with level of differentiation due to its moment of inertia. For instance, moment of inertia are different on the different dead stars. Mercury's moment of inertia is different than Earth's, even though they're both mostly solid liquid material. Venus's is different. Jupiter and Saturn's Moments of inertia are different. Uh, Neptune and Uranus, is, even though they're uh, different ages by about 100 million years, they're different. And they're very close in age, very close in mass as well. And it's very important to not try to group too many things together all at once. Because they're all unique objects. They're all unique. They all have their own past histories. John says, and if not, there must be physical dis disruptors to explain any <coughs> statistical non-correlation between these four factors. There are many more than four factors. There are hundreds of factors. Uh, the disrupting factors, there's a change in mass, there's a change in atmospheric composition, there's a change in orbital configuration, there are rogue objects that enter and exit into systems that can screw everything up. There's changes in barycenters due to objects losing mass as they evolve, meaning the barycenters change, um, which is the center of gravity between multiple orbiting objects. Um, as well, I want to keep, keep, John, <coughs> I want you to realize that don't worry about labeling yourself as a scientist or a non-scientist. That's irrelevant here. If you have a good idea, you write it down, you discuss it, you work out the problems, you try to explain it to the best of your ability. That's, that's basically what a scientist does. If a scientist doesn't do that, then they're not a scientist. They're just running around trying to collect a paycheck. And there's a big difference between the two. You have working scientists that aren't really very scientific, if you get, if you get what I'm saying. They're more or less along the lines of keep their head down, don't rock the boat, don't, uh, don't make anybody upset. Those aren't actual scientists, okay? Uh, they have the label scientist by societal stan standards, but the truth is that a scientist is somebody who rocks the boat. A scientist is somebody who really shakes things up, makes discoveries, and really changes the world. That's what a scientist is. The science by its default is not supposed to be a safe endeavor. It was never supposed to be something that somebody does did as a career. A, si a career scientist is a very recent phenomenon because people realized that they could get a lot of government money to do research. But back in the day, a scientist was usually a privately funded individual who just, you know, would give the middle finger to, to whoever they wanted. They would just do their own thing. They would publish their own books. They would write their own documentation. They would hire and fire their own researchers and uh, people at will. And they could say... You know, to hell with anybody who disagrees with me. That's, that's originally what scientists were like. Um, now it's sort of, there's these huge universities that have billions of dollars to spend and they got to make sure everybody stays in line and everybody thinks the same way. That way they can you know, keep some sort of coherency within the organization. And bureaucracies have built up around those coherencies and the bureaucracies, they, they sort of 
have a tendency of crushing dissent. And now, since those huge bureaucracies are in place, the dissenting people, the best option for them is to just go online and talk about it. But just because you go on YouTube and you publish ideas outside of the universities and those huge bureaucracies, doesn't mean you're not you're not a scientist, okay? It's far from it. You're you're an actual scientist, John. Think about that for a second. Um, as well, in the 1800s, scientists were teaching that Earth was 6,000 years old. Yet non-scientists these days know that Earth is four and a half billion plus years old. So, what is really the difference? It's also relative in a way. The scientists of yesteryear now would just look completely ridiculous. Are they, were they still a scientist? No, it's, that word has multiple connotations. It could, you know, mean a whole lot of things. But I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really worry about it as long as you're thinking up new ideas and you're writing them down. You're, you're a scientist. Um, at least that's what I think. It says here, in other words, gravity can disrupt the tight correlation of the four factors of two bodies interact gravitationally. Yeah, no, gravity does mix things up. It's why the largest, heavier stars have a lot of objects orbiting them, even though they're very young and they're very old stars, very old objects have very few objects orbiting them. Earth had a lot of objects orbiting in its past. The moon was the very last object that continues to orbit Earth. It's been orbiting Earth for an extremely long period of time. And it's still here. Eventually, Earth is going to lose the moon. I know, sad, but... It's just the way things go. As the star ages, it loses the objects that were in orbit around it. Okay, he also says here, if there is no disruptor, then all start then the starting point for all stellar bodies, then there should be a tight correlation at the starting point between the four factors of age, mass, radius, and angular momentum. And well, obviously, when the star starts out young, it, it's very uh, similar to all the others. A good analogy for that would be like a human being um, being born. Babies, you know, they all start out very, 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 very similar. And as they grow in age, they have different experiences. They have different life events that happen to them and they change. So I think it's good to, to look at stars kind of like that. They all sort of have a similar uh, beginning. And as they evolve, different things happen to them, which mixes them up and makes them a lot different. They have different histories. And this is very important because we're talking about orbital, orbital mechanics between bodies over hundreds of millions, billions of years of exchanging orbits between other bodies, some that no longer even exist or were completely tossed out of their host galaxy. So we're talking about mixing on vast scales beyond the comprehension of everybody. I mean, galaxies mix and mingle and exchange stars that are dead, alive, and have evolved over hundreds of billions of years. And then galaxies are reborn again. I got a little picture here of a birthing galaxy. Um, and they just mix like that. And it's been like that since forever. There's never really been a beginning. It's just always been like this. Who knows? Mercury probably came, Mercury and Venus probably came from another galaxy entirely that ran into the Milky Way. And then the Milky Way absorbed that other older galaxy. You never really know. There's a lot of possibility there. Um, and the main point for that is that stars are polymetamorphic, meaning each star system has its own set of stars that have, it, have their own individual histories. They're not all related to each other just because they're in orbit around each other. That's the big worldview change. Uh, the mainstream, they want you to believe that because something orbits something like the sun, then all the ob objects that are orbiting the sun all have th that history that's dependent upon the sun. What I'm saying is that all the objects that orbit the sun have all completely different histories, huge, huge pasts long before the sun even existed. The fact that they orbit the sun now, well, it doesn't really mean anything other than this, they're, they're orbiting the sun now. This is where they are now, but they, it wasn't always like this. The solar system was very different in its past. <clears throat> and here's the big question 
Why are all stars born with high axial angular momentum? Um, what I think is going on, because angular momentum is conserved quantity, it doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Conserved meaning uh, it's conserved. You remove it from somewhere and something else gains that same amount of angular momentum. You just can't create angular momentum out of nothing. When you spin a top with your fingers, your fingers are spinning the top. You're transferring angular momentum to that top to spin it. The top isn't just going to spin on its own. That being said, no matter what you use to spin up a star when it's born, that angular momentum had to have come from something else. Something else very, very big in my opinion. And I'll show you what I think is going on here. Um, but simply, it's very important to understand it's, it's a conserved quantity. You don't have angular momentum appearing out of nothing. Uh, as well, it's a something that can physically make something spin. It just doesn't... You have to have some type of mechanism to make something spin. Think of like a, a, a motor. Sure, the the um, the electricity goes to the to the motor, but those copper windings inside the motor create alternating magnetic fields, which then spin or or push against the the, the stator. The stator and the rotor, I think, is what it's called. I can't remember the two names for inside of a of a motor, but. They, they spin independently of each other, and those magnetic fields, which are alternating, cause that motor to spin. It isn't just the electricity moves something. You have to have the magnetic field also alternating, and then the, the motor can spin, given it's in a, in a good orientation and you have all the mechanics right. So there has to be some type of physical process to get that star to spin up. As well, you need to understand that it's a conserved quantity. You just can't create angular momentum out of nothing. And that being said, we have here something that Electric Universe people have never mentioned in any of their videos. And trust me, I've watched a lot of Electric Universe videos. Not one single of them, one of them mentions this. Pay attention very, very closely. This is Hercules A. Or 3C348, that's its official designation, Hercules A. This is what's called a radio galaxy. Now, they say radio galaxy because in the radio frequencies, the really long spectrum electro, or of the electromagnetic field, the, the long radio waves, the long portion of the EM spectrum, what happens is when they look at these galaxies... They see a big blob in the, in the visible spectrum. There's a big blob right here in the visible spectrum. But these lobes are not visible to your eyes. You cannot see these with your eyes. These radiate in the radio frequency of the EM spectrum, these big lobes, as well as that center object. And as you'll notice here, it kind of looks like a double-ended sprinkler where it's shooting out two jets of material two huge jets of material and you see these uh it looks like um i don't know i don't know if a good way of describing that just like a big cloud and you see these little shock fronts of this cloud that go jutting outwards now to a regular person you think oh well there's nothing significant happening there but you have to also understand that this object isn't a lawn sprinkler. This distance from here to here is hundreds of thousands of light years in distant in distance. So what this means is what you're looking at when you see a radio galaxy with these bilobed configurations like this, you're seeing galaxy birth. This is a galaxy being born. That's what radio galaxies are. They're shooting out material they're creating the material needed, and they're creating hundreds of millions of stars, of hot young stars. Now, you say, oh, well, that's just a big cloud. There's nothing significant happening there. There's not hundreds of millions of stars in these forming in these two big lobes. It's total nonsense. The reason why I know this is the same reasoning behind blood. Blood 
looks like a liquid, but under a microscope, one single drop of blood has between 130 to 200 million red blood cells. Now you wouldn't know that by looking at blood, you think it's just a fluid. That's what you should be looking at radio galaxies as. When you see a big cloud like that, you're not seeing just a big gas cloud. There are hundreds of millions of stars being born in these, in these two big blobs of material. This is where star birth happens. Stars are being born by the hundreds of millions of them. And the original angular momentum that the stars spin with comes from the dissipation of a galaxy being born. Remember when I mentioned that angular momentum is a conserved quantity? The quantity, the, the amount of angular momentum that a star has comes directly from the process of a galaxy being born, which means whatever is happening right here is by far the most energetic event in the entire universe. This is what creates entire galaxies, whatever is in the center right there. It creates entire galaxies. And those galaxies create, or it's creating galaxies, which is hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions of stars. And those stars in turn cool and evolve inside the general theory of cellular metamorphosis and then create life. So essentially what you're seeing here is the universe, its most energetic, most violent process, creating objects that are going to evolve over many hundreds of millions of years and that are going to eventually form life on them. totally mind-boggling but I don't know why you doesn't mention this but uh I guess I guess they haven't really they don't really know about it I don't know I've I've been telling them about this since like 2012 2011 I guess they just ignore me for some reason um, but anyways if you want to look up these types of objects go on uh, Google or DuckDuckGo and type in radio galaxies you'll see a whole bunch of these they have brand new galaxies that are being born. Which also, I don't know, I guess it kind of puts a wrench in the Big Bang Theory, which says all galaxies came from a Big Bang. No, galaxies are born and die inside of the universe. No Big Bang ever happened. And we know galaxies are born and die because we can see a galaxy being born right here. Anyways, you guys, I think I made this video long enough. I, I was going to talk about another paper I wrote up. What total axial angular momentum will be for life hosting stars? Um, I guess I'll do another talk on that later. I just wanted to answer uh, John's questions here and then show him how fantastic of a universe we really live in outside of uh, Electric Universe's um, um, mythology stuff. <laughs> All right, you guys. Later.